Hollywood, the land of dreams, of celluloid heroes, a place where your wildest dreams can come true. You just have to want it bad enough. At least that's what legions of young wannabes and talented misfits believe. They flock to Tinseltown with a story, something to prove, and a dream. What happens when that dream goes unfulfilled? When the dreamer gets steamrolled in the dream factory? What if you're not the one? If you're not talented or lucky or crazy enough to truly make it? Well, then your stories have much darker endings. Today on Scream to Scream, we part the velvet ropes, whisk you inside, and take you backstage for an in-depth look at one of Hollywood's premier comedy venues, the Comedy Store, and how, according to many eyewitnesses, this venerable venue has some decidedly unfunny regulars. But before we get to the stand-up dramedy, don't forget to subscribe to Graveyard Shift for even more horror news and macabre content. And be sure to drop a comment to let us know what stories you want to hear about next. Now, join us for a trip down the Walk of Fame to a little club with a checkered past. Los Angeles loves a self-made hero, even when they're not so self-made. Hollywood celebrates an overnight sensation, 20 years in the making. Showbiz creates people who face a tsunami of rejection in an effort to overcome the odds and ride the wave of success. To jumpstart your career and get famous, you need to get yourself noticed. Many performers do this by writing for themselves, putting on shows, appearing at open mic nights, or performing stand-up at comedy clubs across the city. Among a long lineage of prominent comedy venues in the City of Angels, arguably the most famous of them all is the Comedy Store. Located at 8433 West Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood, California, the Comedy Store is a legendary institution in the American comedy landscape. Countless major comedians have either come directly from this venue or passed through it on their way to the top. Opened in the early 70s by famed comedians Sammy Shore and Rudy DeLuca, the Comedy Store quickly became the destination for both established and aspiring comedians. It began as a comic-friendly space to experiment with your material and hone your act. In that, it was very successful. Unfortunately, Sammy and Rudy were comedians, not businessmen, and their reign over the venue was short-lived. Just a year after opening, Sammy divorced his wife, Mitzi Shore, who received ownership of the Comedy Store in the settlement. Mitzi turned out to be a shrewd businesswoman with a keen eye for talent and exerted a strong hand in the club's operations and the development of performers for decades to come. But the building at 8433 West Sunset Boulevard has a deeper, darker history. Before it was a comedy club, the building was a nightclub known as Ciro's, a notorious late night haunt during the 1940s and 1950s. During its heyday, Ciro's was the place to be and to be seen frequented by the likes of Sinatra and Marilyn, Bogey and Bacall, Dean Martin and Ava Gardner. But there were persistent rumors that Ciro's was run by mobsters as a front and a discreet haven for extra-legal individuals. Named after Ciro Capozzi, who opened the first Ciro's in Monaco in 1892, the restaurant and club housed many members of the Sicilian crime syndicate La Cosa Nostra and their business partners. The original Ciro's on Sunset Boulevard went bankrupt in the late 50s and was sold to a group that opened a restaurant and a bar, also called Ciro's, but that club went under too. The building was used as a music venue during the 1960s. In 1972, it reopened as the Comedy Store, a place of jokes, fun, and laughter. Still, the building's dark history and its whispered links to organized crime are not so easily overwritten, and the grasping hunger of those vying for attention and fame permeates the stage. Maybe it's not so surprising that people have reported seeing some very unfunny things at the comedy store, things of an unexplainable nature that just might be linked to the nefarious actions of the mob or the sheer desperation to be a star. Rumors that multiple people were murdered and even buried on the premises continue to swirl through the back alleys of the comedy world. Some even suggest that the reason that Ciro's went under was specifically to hide these criminal actions. Lori Jacobson was a waitress at the club and wrote a book about its paranormal history. 
She writes about repeatedly witnessing strange and otherworldly happenings there, like moving objects, odd noises, and feelings of dread. Joey Gaynor worked as a doorman at the comedy store for years. He reported multiple unexplainable experiences as well. During an overnight shift at around 3 a.m., Gaynor claims that he was closing up the venue when he noticed two lit candles on a table. He blew them out and continued his closing duties. But when he glanced back to double check that he'd not forgotten anything, he noticed that those same candles were still lit. Gaynor snuffed them again, but again, as he looked over his shoulder on his way out, he saw that the candles had been relit. At the same time, he says he felt a presence in the room and unseen eyes watching him. Closing up again on another night shift, Gaynor says he found chairs stacked on top of each other in mysterious ways and various items strewn around the room. At first he thought nothing of it and began to straighten up the room, but then he felt a cold hand touch his shoulder and fled the building immediately. Blake Clark also worked as a doorman at the comedy store. He says he heard many stories about ghosts and strange happenings, but refused to believe them. He remained a vocal skeptic until one night when while locking up the location, he heard a noise. He turned around just in time to witness a bar stool drag itself across the main stage, completely unassisted by any visible force. It was as if the invisible man was moving the stool to the other side of the stage in order to sit on it. This one supernatural sighting forever changed Clark's perspective on ghosts. He became a devout believer from that moment on, telling every detail of the encounter to anyone who would listen. Clark and Gaynor both claimed to have heard strange noises and gurgling sounds throughout the venue. Clark even described an instance in which he taunted a ghost, only to have it snatch up an ashtray and fling it across the room in an apparent response. Michael Becker, a booker who handles events and special occasions at the comedy store, claims he's repeatedly seen a ghostly apparition wearing a 1940s suit haunting the venue. Becker guesses it may be the ghost of someone who ran afoul of the mobsters who ran the club and was killed as a result. Perhaps strangest of all, both Gaynor and Clark say they've seen a black mist floating along the floor in lower regions of the club. They described it as a thick, viscous substance that seems to react to human presence, almost as if the substance knows when a conscious being is nearby, seeming to have a mind all its own. The entity many believe responsible for all of these sightings is a ghost named Gus. Urban legend has it that Gus was a bodyguard employed by the mob-connected owners at Ciro's. He did the dirty work for the original owner's crew, the man who handled the business no one else wanted to handle. The story goes that he was employed by Ciro's as a doorman until unfortunately, he pissed off the wrong people and was whacked on the premises. Many famous comedians have seen Gus. In fact, Johnny Sanchez and Bobby Lee of Mad TV fame have repeatedly told a story in which they witnessed Gus's gaunt, undead visage. According to them, they were leaving the comedy store late one night when they felt a presence observing them. They both looked up to a window overlooking the parking lot to see a face peering down at them. It had high cheekbones, a greenish complexion, and translucent skin, and it blinked at them. Frozen in sheer terror and intimidation, they could only glance at each other briefly, as if to both reaffirm what they were seeing was real. But when their joint gaze returned to the second-story window, the face had disappeared. And that's not the only time Bobby Lee saw the apparition. He also claims that once while he was playing the piano, he looked over and saw a tall, thin man wearing a strange hat and dressed in a yellow suit striding toward him. The man appeared to be dead, as his eyes were sunken, black and glassy. Startled and overcome with fear, Lee jumped backwards only to realize he was in the room completely alone. Comedian Joey Diaz also claims to have seen Gus. He says that he once saw a large man in a top hat and cape lurking in the shadows of the club who abruptly covered his face upon being spotted and receded out of view. Another sighting of Gus, which has taken on its own urban legend status, involves the great and tragic Sam Kinison. When Kinison was first starting out, he was so broke he would sleep at the comedy store after it closed. He skirted from dive bar to dive bar throughout the evening until the comedy store closed up shop. Then he would sneak into the club and sleep on the stage. 
One morning, as employees of the club were coming in to open up and prepare the place for that day's events, they discovered Sam Kinison floating four feet off the stage. The diminutive gnome-like comedian was levitating in midair, as if being held by someone. As soon as the Comedy Store employees entered the room, the floating Kinison was dropped to the stage with a bang. By 1979, the Comedy Store was the place to perform stand-up in Los Angeles. Mitzi Shore was rumored to be pulling in millions of dollars in revenue. The comedians actually putting on the performances, however, were all completely unpaid at the time. This prompted many of them to decide to form a union, dubbed Comedians for Compensation. They picketed for six weeks from March to May of that year, demanding pay for their performances. Shore, meanwhile, insisted that her venue added more value to the performers than the other way around. She claimed that the place helped young comedians work out their material and showcase their acts in front of casting directors, thus contributing to their fame and financial success. In her mind, it was a quid pro quo, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours arrangement. The comedy store continued to rake in large amounts of money while it enjoyed cultural prestige on the entertainment landscape. Meanwhile, the performers who were putting butts in the seats were just scraping by, poor and desperate. Anybody who knows a comic knows they can be the saddest, darkest person they know. Ultimately, the union was unsuccessful in achieving its goals, and some comedians were blacklisted from performing there during the struggle. One of those performers committed suicide. Shortly after the strike failed, a comic named Steve Lubetkin jumped from the Hyatt House, a large hotel directly adjacent to the comedy store. He left a note. My name is Steve Lubetkin, and I used to work at the comedy store. He was apparently hopeful that his drastic action would be enough to convince the powers that be to adequately compensate performers. It did not. However, performers did begin receiving minimal compensation for their labor shortly afterwards. Many people have claimed to witness Steve's ghost lingering around the club. Some people have reported being pushed by him in the halls, remarking that there was a strange man wearing clothes from the 1980s, only to realize that he was a ghost. Others have said they've seen him waiting to use the restroom, only to become frustrated and leave in a huff. Some people have even claimed to witness him standing in one room of the comedy store, looking up at where the Hyatt House used to be. Many believe that he meant to leap to his death onto the roof of the comedy store, but fell short, as he did in life, and died upon impact with a boulevard of broken dreams instead. The Comedy Store is a hallowed institution in Los Angeles, a place where careers have been made and dreams broken, where just about every famous comedian or comic actor has died on stage and suffered for their craft, hoping for that chance to be noticed, to make people laugh, to become a star, to be loved, and maybe to be immortal. But the building that houses the Comedy Store has secrets of its own, memories of dark deeds and shades of desperate spirits who linger there, longing to achieve what had eluded them in life. The heady cocktail of Hollywood showbiz and the mafia underworld drew them to this building on LA's Sunset Strip, and the brutal realities of life and death have them trapped there for an eternity. So what do you think? Is the comedy store haunted? Does its mob-related past make it more likely that people died on the premises and may be buried there to this day? Do ghostly regulars from various decades stalk the halls? What's keeping them there? And what is the deal with the creeping black mist that seems to have a mind of its own? Let us know in the comments below if you've got the courage. Like, share, and subscribe to Graveyard Shift for more sinister stories. And let us know what tragic tales you want to learn more about. And as always, check back next time to find out what else we'll make it from Scream to Scream.